Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Kate Sneeden. We are editors at Dance Media, and in today's episode, we'll be discussing Camille Brown's Virtual School of Social Dance and Brown's ongoing mission to lift up social dance styles, talking about the dance studio crisis happening in Los Angeles and its effects on the area's wider dance scene, getting into the ways ballet companies are finally beginning to address the harmful stereotypes in La Bayadere, and what a 21st century production of the ballet might look like and hearing a message from dance filmmaker Nell Shelby about her work on this year's reimagined part digital Table of Silence project, which is a dance for peace performed each year on 9-11. We're excited for you all to hear Nell's particular perspective on how the pandemic has altered the dance world. But do you all have other dance world movers and shakers? I mean, to use a terribly well-worn but still fitting turn of phrase, that you would like to hear from because we're planning our upcoming lineup of voice memos and hopefully down the road longer interviews as well and we'd love your input on potential guests um if there's a dancer or a dance administrator or a dance teacher or some other kind of dance world superstar that you think would be great on the pod please we encourage you to drop us a line on twitter at dance underscore edit or to dm us on instagram at the.dance.edit or you can just email me directly at m fuhrer f is in frank u h r e r at dancemedia.com so now as usual it's time for our weekly dance headline rundown um just some of the top dance stories of the week in brief so cadence you want to start us off sure um broadway and film dancer virginia doris known professionally as virginia bosler died recently at age 93 a favorite dancer of choreographer agnes demille virginia performed in works like bloomer girl brigadoon and the film edition of oklahoma Uh, buckets and tap shoes co-founder rick osland was recently discharged from the hospital after being involved in a bike accident that resulted in a traumatic brain injury a gofundme to assist with medical bills has already surpassed its twenty five thousand dollar goal Uh, Colorado Ballet has canceled all performances until 2021, furloughed its dancers until January 2021, and reduced the salaries of its staff for the foreseeable future. This comes as a major blow to the company's 60th anniversary season, and leadership anticipates revenue losses between $3.5 million and $4 million. And sorry to say that my next news item is no more cheerful. Uh, New York City ballet dancers have banded together to start their own relief fund as the company is reportedly unable to provide adequate financial assistance to get them through the end of the year. They are planning to donate 10% of what they raise to the General Agma Relief Fund, and more info can be found at dancersofnycb.com. It is worth noting, uh, Twitter detectives have looked into the company's most recent publicly available tax records and noted that as of 2018, some executive and artistic staff were making six and seven figure salaries. Not a good look if that's still the case. Um, Pittsburgh Ballet Theater Artistic Director Susan Jaffe announced her plan to help the company weather the pandemic storm a series of open-air performances. The company's main stage season will become a socially distanced outdoor experience in a new, quote-unquote, mobile performing arts venue. And they're also planning to reimagine their Nutcracker outside of the traditional theater setting. What a way to begin her first season as artistic director. Yeah. But it sounds like some creative ideas. Yeah, power to her. Um, Houston Ballet launched Breaking Boundaries, a conversation series between current and former Black, Indigenous, and people of color who have been part of the company about their experiences as dancers of color. The first episode includes Adrian Vincent James, Sandra Organ, and Lauren Anderson, and the second episode includes current members Harper Waters, Kellen Hornbuckle, and Nazir Muhammad. It's really fantastic. We'll link to that in the episode description. After 16 years on television, Strictly Come Dancing, Dancing with the Stars' British sister show, will finally feature its first same-sex dancing partnership, pairing boxer Nicola Adams with a female professional. Queer representation, yes! (laughs) Um, CBS has announced a new unscripted dance show, working title, Dance With Me. The premise, a talented young dancer invites a family member or other adult who has supported their dance dreams, but who is not themselves a dancer, to become their dance partner as they compete routines against other duos. Yeah, who from the Dance Spirit universe do we think is going to end up on this show? Because I I have a bunch of names I have a feeling are already involved. I would love to see your dream cast, Margaret. (laughs) 
In other exciting television-related news, a new documentary is coming to the PBS American Masters series, all about legendary dancer, director, and choreographer Twyla Tharp. The film, Twyla Moves, will provide a first-hand look at Tharp's famously rigorous creative and choreographic process. And we are very excited. (laughs) I, part of this documentary and this even just saying all these names together gets me excited. She's creating a socially distanced piece on Misty Copeland, Herman Cornejo and Maria Kareva. And we get a full behind the scenes look at that in the documentary. Which it's so rare to get behind the scenes Twyla anything, mm-hmm. frankly. Seriously. Yeah. Things to look forward to. So in our next segment, we'd like to talk for a few minutes about Camille Brown. Um, actually, frankly, we'd always like to be talking about Camille Brown. Her work is is that extraordinary. But this week, the New York Times published a profile on Brown and the unique virtual school that she's established during the pandemic. So on Brown's Instagram page, members of her company have been giving lessons in social dance styles, which are almost never taught in Western dance schools. Um, she's also turned the space over to academics and artists for lectures on the meanings and the legacies of those social forms. And she's also continuing her social dance driven Everybody Moves program for children, um, which she began back in 2015. That's going on in both in person and virtual ways. Um, and all of this is of a piece with Brown's choreographic work, which frequently centers social dance and the way that it fosters feelings of freedom and community. I mean, how do we love Camille A. Brown? Let us count the ways. Um, She (laughs) is absolutely extraordinary. We love her concert dance work. We love the work that she brings to Broadway. And we love that she also extends what she does into social justice and in social dance, which is such an important part of her choreography, as Margaret noted. Um, One of the things she talked about in this fantastic New York Times profile Uh, looking at this sort of Instagram school is talking about how, you know, the electric slide was a thing that was expected to be left at the studio door when she was coming up training. And I think it's incredibly cool that she's taking these social vernacular dance forms, which are valid and important and this key piece of expression, and saying, this is equally valid as these like Western concert dance forms that have been privileged for so long. Yeah, I think we really commonly in the dance education sphere see a devaluation of African American vernacular dance forms. You know, we're taught that they are less skilled, less technical, and that they don't need to be studied. Um, But I think Brown is making the point that what we emphasize in education has a lasting impact on like the creation of our communities. So if we fail to emphasize these forms of dance early on in our education, um, they're not going to be as prevalent later on in our communities. Yeah. And Courtney, you talked about how Camille is invested in social justice as well as dance. Social Social dance is inherently a part Mm -hmm. of so many of these social justice Mm -hmm. movements. I mean, first of all, it's just more inclusive from the beginning than all of the codified Western styles that are most common in concert dance settings. Dancers in social dance are always active participants in the shaping of the vocabulary. You know, I think so much of what we love about dance, regardless of what dance form you are personally invested in practicing yourself, so much of what we love about it, I think, is the aspects of ritual and the aspects of coming together Mm -hmm. and working as a group. Even Mm -hmm. if you're working on your own technique, you are working as a group in this group setting. It is inherently a communal exercise. And social dance is saying, yes, that is the point. And here in our time of quarantine, I think having social dance, even if it's through a screen, is huge. Yeah, I think they even call the series on Instagram social dance for social distancing. It's just it's this idea of maintaining that connection in the way that we can at this moment as a a form of of therapy in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, So kudos to Camille for beginning to write this this longstanding wrong, the way that social dance has been treated in the in the concert dance world. Um, So. Heading over to the West Coast now in our next segment, we'd like to talk about a recent LA Times story highlighting just how many of the city's prominent dance studios have either closed already since the pandemic began or are now on the brink of closure. Um, And actually, in just the few days since the story ran, yet another major organization, Movement Lifestyle, revealed that it would be closing its own studio in North Hollywood. Um, So these announcements are tragic in their own right. Dance studios provide homes, they provide communities for so many dancers, especially in the commercial dance world, which is often very alienating. It's very every dancer for themselves. But the closures are also part of the LA dance scene's larger COVID crisis. 
Yeah, over the past weeks and months, we've seen kind of similar announcements coming out of a lot of different iconic LA dance studios, hubs like the Peter Performing Space, Edge, and like Margaret mentioned, Movement Lifestyle have all announced that they're either leaving or being forced out of their brick and mortar spaces. Even before the pandemic, running a dance studio in LA was, you know, notoriously challenging and incredibly expensive. And many studios struggled to stay afloat amid real estate development and rising rents across the city. Many well-known studios were already closing last year, pre-pandemic, and it seems like the coronavirus may accelerate the closures of many more. Well, and there's a number of studios, like, I know of The Sweat Spot, which, like, Ryan Heffington, one of Mm -hmm. the most recognizable names, that brick-and-mortar studio is shutting down, and it was kind of a situation where they knew they were going to be out at the end of this year because of a developer, and they were thinking, Mm -hmm. okay, we're going to buy another space, but then the pandemic happens, and they're basically saying this isn't financially responsible for us to do right now. Yeah, I think it was Heffington in particular mentioned that in the beginning of the pandemic, his online classes were well attended and he was able to, you know, secure some income from that. But at this point, his studio's attendance has greatly dropped. So his revenue has decreased significantly. Yeah, I I think it is interesting to talk about where um, online learning fits into this picture. Mm-hmm. Makeda Easter, who wrote the story, did talk to John Arpino, the director of CLI Studios, which is all online dance learning. But I mean, even John Arpino, who is fully invested in this type of training, said, no, there is no substitution mm-hmm. for in-person dance training. Every interview he's given, that's yeah. always, that's his bottom yeah. line. And it's it's the truth. Yeah, I think I just, I'm really fearful of seeing LA become the place where online dance classes are filmed. And that's yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And given that so much of this is related to rent, too, I mean, you have to guess that there's a New York City version of this story Mm -hmm. waiting to be written. There's a San Mm -hmm. Francisco version of this story waiting to be written. Well, and I think also, you know, in California, before COVID, we were talking about AB5 and how that Mm -hmm. was going to be impacting uh, dancers and dance teachers in California. And then the pandemic comes along and really compounds a lot of those issues On top of which, the reality of the way that real estate developers seem to think is you are trying to maximize what profit you can get from the least amount of space. And Mm -hmm. doing that calculation, dance studios require a lot of space Mm -hmm. for comparatively not that big upscale of a profit. So it's an issue where you have to have someone who is making those decisions who understands the value Mm -hmm. of, yes, we need to dedicate this amount of space in order for this thing to even exist, not we're going to shove this into this tiny, tiny little square footage space like a Starbucks. And just to clarify, AB5, Assembly Bill 5, um, that's the gig economy law that makes it harder to treat workers as independent contractors, originally intended to protect Uber and Lyft drivers, but it also created all kinds of confusion for Mm -hmm. dancers and other members of the arts community. About whether and how it applies to dance artists if uh, if dance companies need to be treating the dance artists by those regulations. Yeah, it just seems like the concert dance scene in LA was finally starting Mm -hmm. to pick up some steam, and now suddenly everything is heading in the opposite direction. Um, Oh, just things are looking darker than we would like them to. in the the LA dance scene. Um, But in our next segment, we're going to fight off some of that darkness by looking forward to a potentially brighter future for a ballet that has long been controversial. Um, Point Magazine published a story this week discussing the ways that some ballet companies are finally, finally beginning to confront Le Bayadere's um, just offensive Orientalist stereotypes. And in case you're not super familiar with Le Bayadere and its story, I'm just going to quote the description that Phil Chan of Final Bow for Yellow Face gives in the piece, because it's perfect. Nothing about Le Bayadere is actually Indian, not the music, the story, the characters, the choreography, the collaborators. It is a fantasy depiction of Indian culture by Western artists for a homogenous Western audience. That's it. That said, there are still elements of the ballet that some argue are worth preserving, like its iconic Kingdom of the Shades scene, and it's frequently brilliant variations, classical variations by Petipa. So the question is, how might one make a contemporary production of Le Bayadere, and is that a project worth pursuing? Courtney, go. I know you're ready to go. (laughs) (laughs) So the thing about Bayadere, right, is that 
so much of it stems from um, trendy Orientalism in the West in the 19th century. And so much of that stems from, in particular, Labayadere's case, a complete misrepresentation and misunderstanding of the Devadasi tradition. Those dancers were brought to the West and toured almost kind of like vaudeville acts, which led to writers like Théophile Gautier writing about them and imagining scenarios uh, based on this fascinating to them culture that they did not understand, which leads to Marius Petipa creating the first Labayadere. And so now you fast forward to today where we have so much more knowledge of how completely and totally incorrect everything in this Mm -hmm. ballet is. And it's nearly impossible to look at this ballet and be like, yeah, this is fine the way it is. <laughs> that said, that's further complicated by looking at ballet history and looking at the place that La Bayadere holds in it. Um, for example, just looking at American dance history. American ballet theater would not be American ballet theater without Natalia Makarova's staging Makarova. of yep. first uh, the Kingdom of the Shades act and then the full ballet for ABT, then called ballet theater. It is what essentially whipped that corps de ballet into shape and got American audiences and critics to start taking the company seriously in the United States. So it, of course, has this key place in the classical ballet canon, but also really, 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 really problematic. So what do you do with that? So yeah, and the Point Magazine piece discusses several different approaches that people have been taking um, to reimagining by Adair. So one way, and this is the approach that Angel Correa took at Pennsylvania Ballet last year, is to bring in experts in Indian dance and Indian culture as consultants. So Correa asked Pallabi Chakravorty, who's a dance anthropologist and Swarthmore College professor, to look at the choreography and incorporate some more authentic gestures, more authentic usage of the eyes. But of course, there are limits to this approach. I think actually in the point piece, Chakravorty describes it as it's like cooking pasta, but putting a little cumin in it. Um, <laughs> Another way is the approach of British contemporary choreographer Shobana Jayasinghe, who responded to Le Bayadere with an original choreographic work called Bayadere, The Ninth Life. Which I desperately wish I could have gone to London to see because everything about this ballet sounds fascinating to me. I say ballet, contemporary piece. Here's hoping in the aftertimes that it tours to the U.S., Um, But she looked really deeply at the whole oriental trope of the Indian temple dancer and explored it from a completely different angle. The third route, which Phil Chan and scholar Doug Follington are working on right now, is a version that moves the ballet to a totally different setting. So they chose the golden age of Hollywood. Um, They're using most of the same pedipa steps and the minkus music, but it's just in a completely different context, minus all the problematic stereotypes. Um, I know some companies are interested in that, so very curious to see that once it makes, makes its way to the stage. Yeah, I'm deeply intrigued by that approach. And because so like just boil down to just steps, so much of it is, I mean, transcendent and gorgeous and so challenging as a dancer. And I think that, you know, that's like what we love about La Bayadere, but it seems like finally we're reaching this point where we're not going to allow tradition to be an excuse for racist and offensive portrayals of other cultures. So I think like the idea that we can potentially... Here in the year 2020. (laughs) Here in the year 2020, where we have nothing to do but sit and think about our wrongdoings in the past. Hashtag 2020. It is, it's both a perfect and a strange time to be having this conversation. Good in the sense that, yeah, companies suddenly do have time to think about these important questions, but weird in the sense that nobody knows when a performance of a huge production like La Bayadere will realistically be possible again. So I guess, fingers crossed that all of this important but abstract debate can lead to concrete action sooner Mm. rather than later. So now we have the next installment in our voice memo series. And this week, our message is from Nell Shelby, who is a widely respected dance filmmaker and a former dancer herself. Um, Shelby has been involved in choreographer Jacqueline Buglisi's powerful Table of Silence project, which is a dance ceremony performed each year on September 11th, usually at Lincoln Center Plaza, since its first performance back in 2011. Um, This year, tomorrow, Shelby will be live streaming a reimagined version of that work, which you'll hear more about in her memo. Um, You'll also hear about how different her world feels and the stakes of her job feel now that video is pretty much the only way most of us can see dance. Here she is. Hey, Dance Edit listeners. My name is Nell Shelby, and I'm the owner of Nell Shelby Productions. My company is a video production company, and we specialize in filming dance. 
I've been documenting dance in New York City for the past 18 years. I started out uh, getting my BFA in dance and my BS in broadcast video, got an internship at Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival, and realized that I could make this a career, moved to New York City, um, bought a camera and a computer, and my world opened up for sure. So that's what I've been doing for the past 18 years. And then um, the past six months has been very challenging, like it has for everyone. Um, on March 15th, I lost most of my jobs. Um, and pretty much everyone canceled or postponed. And that was a huge shift like it has been for all of us. And then about a month later, Teachers College reached out to me and asked if I could produce their convocation with them. And I just dove in. I thought, how am I going to do this from my home office? But I did it. And it taught me a lot. And so then after that, I was then asked to produce the Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival gala, virtual gala, and then the Vail Dance Festival that's been one of my clients. We produced eight shows for them, and we produced the virtual festival for Jacob's Pillow. We did three shows a week. And so I really um, turned my business around, and what's been really exciting for me has been that, you know, before video sometimes was a bit of an afterthought, you know, the dance performance was the most important thing and making sure that the live audience saw the, this performance. And then it was like, oh yeah. And by the way, we need to get video. <laughs> and so I, you know, that's, the, I was sort of like the, the end, the very last thing. Now it's been such a switch for me because now I'm sort of the, first thing and really the only thing that we can do right now to get our message out there until um, the table of silence, which is happening this Friday um, for 9-11, commemorating 9-11. It is a performance about peace and oneness. And I have been live streaming this show for the past 10 years with Buglisi Dance Theater and Jackie Buglisi. I was asked 10 years ago to, um, to film it and live stream it. It was when live stream was very new, when internet was not that great. So it was extremely nerve wracking. But now here we are with this is how we can get our message out to the world. So it's been really um, a pretty big undertaking. Lincoln Center has opened up the plaza and they're bringing back um, their staff and union people to work on this. We are all abiding by all the COVID regulations. I've had to sign documents. I have um, had to come up with my own COVID regulations for Nell Shelby Productions. It's not that unusual. It's like, you know, still wearing masks and social distancing and sanitizing, but it does feel like there's a lot of stuff to read and just make sure that we're all really being as safe as possible and that we're all adhering to the, to the guidelines in this situation. Um, so Table of Silence has been reimagined. Normally it has a hundred plus dancers on the plaza. Now it's going to have 25 dancers, less musicians. I'm actually, instead of three cameras, I'm doing one camera and, um, I've tried to scale back my team a lot more. So I think it's just a little bit, you know, it's been, I have to admit, it's been a little stressful, but it's also like when I think of the reason why we're doing this and we are trying to pursue this amidst the challenge and not just sit in our homes, but just figure out how to make things happen. That's been really inspiring to me. So right now I'm working on a lot of different projects. People are calling me to um, either help them produce their shows or help them edit their shows. A lot of people are transitioning and pivoting to digital content. And um, that's really the way that we need to go right now. And so I would just encourage everyone to just constantly you know, use your community and think outside of the box and talk to each other. I mean, that's what I've just been doing. I know everyone's creating a lot of different budgets and a lot of different scenarios and a lot of different ideas. And I, I think just continuing to, to brainstorm and think what is possible during this time. And of course, do it, you know, within your comfort level. But I've just been really inspired by a lot of the creative ideas that have been happening. And, um, and hopefully this will make a huge shift in our world moving forward and that people, um, dance companies and um, organizations will realize that being a media company is what we have to do. You know, once the theater's open, we still need to create content. 
we still need to get our message out there. And now it can reach all over the world. Thank you so much, Nell. Um, please make sure to give Nell a follow on Instagram at Nell, N-E-L, Shelby, S-H-E-L-B-Y. And to visit her website, nellshelby.com, just to keep up with everything she's working on. She has so many irons in the fire. Um, also be sure to live stream the Reimagined Table of Silence performance tomorrow morning, September 11th. It starts at 7.55 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, you can find complete information about the project and where to watch it at tableofsilence.org. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will, as usual, be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Um, in the meantime, keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.